Aaron Hernandez was a multi-sport prodigy born and raised in Bristol, Connecticut. With a tumultuous childhood featuring abuse from his father, to both of his parents being arrested for different crimes, there was seemingly nowhere to go but up. Unbeknownst to Aaron, there was an NFL dynasty nine years in the making, waiting for him 100 miles away in Foxborough, Massachusetts. A path that seemingly would have been the best fit for him, the hometown kid done good. But this path would eventually lead to his future arrest and life imprisonment. This is the story of the life, crimes, and downfall of the New England Patriots tight end, Aaron Hernandez. That's today on Death in Entertainment. Live from Los Angeles. 911, what is your emergency? Here in Hollywood now. Two counts of murder, injury, and death. Oh my God! Shocking new details that has stunned the entertainment world. Um, this makes me a little nervous. The hair stood up on my arms. Just like in the movies. Ah! What do you call this thing anyway? Death in entertainment. Greetings, Dipod Universe. Hello again. Hello, hello, hello. What is going on, everybody? My name is Kyle Plouffe. And I'm Alejandro Dowling. And this week, oh my lord. This dude, is a long time coming. This is one of the most highly sought after episodes uh, from our viewers. It is a doozy, so I suggest people settle down with a glass of water, perhaps a glass of wine, which is what we are enjoying right now. Yeah, we're going a little <laughs> crazy here with the... <laughs> little Gallo family Chardonnay. The kind you find in the mini fridge. Yes, that costs like $20 for a bottle if you're getting it out of the uh, hotel mini bar that they got there. And I'm surprised you want to do this episode. This, this, you know, there's a lot of um, feelings in this one. (laughs) Because you are a lifelong Patriots fan. Yeah, and for a lot of these episodes, I wear a Patriots hat. Uh, I am not wearing one today because, you know... To honor the victims. Yes, exactly. My hat is at half mast right now. And this episode, for lack of a better word, you're sort of taking a dump on the dynasty. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> uh, this is, you know, one of the many marks against the dynasty, and I understand that. Yeah, without further ado, I think we just get into it. Okay, I'm ready. Let's get a baby. You so crazy. No, you stay shook. Me and the mic that's like Brady with the playbook. Right. I've been hearing a whole lot of big talk Bunch of dudes walking around like some big shots My team been putting in the work So if you want a war, we right here screaming Yeah, yeah, you heard that This is for the ones that you hit and never heard back A lot of dudes chirping, but we about results though If you want a problem, we'll be here yeah. Okay, Aaron Joseph Hernandez was born on November 6, 1989. So this is the might be the youngest perpetrator we've had. Oh my god. Other gosh. than Grantham, actually. Grantham? Yeah. Judith Barcy. Yes, but she was a victim. Oh, you mean perpetrator? Perpetrator. Oh, I'm sorry, Judith. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you say that because I firmly believe there is a Joseph curse out there. Mm. Because he spells his name, his middle name Joseph is J O S E F. No, I think that is a predictor of things to come for anyone with this version of the name bestowed upon them upon birth. Right. Let's go through the list real quick. Joseph Bueller, a Nazi government official executed for his crimes against humanity. Terrible person. Josef Dietrich, German Waffen SS general and war criminal. Asshole. Joseph Fritzl, Austrian sex offender and multi-child murderer. Oof, any name that rhymes with schnitzel. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Joseph Albert Meisinger, also known as the Butcher of Warsaw. Guess what? He's another German Nazi SS and Gestapo officer arrested and executed for his crimes against humanity. It's never good when your nickname starts with the Butcher of. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Uh, Joseph Mengele. Oh, I know this guy. German SS officer, so-called physician, and definite war criminal. Another Joseph Oberhauser, Nazi SS concentration camp commandant and Holocaust perpetrator. So a lot of these have ties to Hitler. Yeah, a few of them. (laughs) Joseph Schwamberger. Nazi SS forced labor camp commandant. Mm. And finally, related to the Diapod universe, you just gave a little foreshadowing, murderer of his own daughter, Joseph Barcy. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the worst dads in history. Yeah. Uh, If that's not enough to sell you, let's listen to this little ditty, this little story about Aaron Joseph Hernandez. We go from Joseph Barcy, who's on the shit list in the Diepod universe, to another terrible father who is definitely on the shit list in the Diepod universe. So, like I said... Aaron Hernandez was born November 6, 1989, and grew up in Bristol, Connecticut, which is also the birthplace of ESPN. When I think of Connecticut, why do I think of well-to-do? Because there's a lot of, like, uh, Westchester, Connecticut, and, like, uh, Greenwich. It's, like, all these... There are a lot of well-to-do, very yuppie, you know, sweater tied around the neck type people. Yeah, and is that this family? No. Oh, okay. Bristol, Connecticut is like Stanford, Connecticut, is it's rough. Okay, so it's like the armpit of Connecticut. Yes. ESPN was founded on September 7th, 1979, so it was a decade old by the time Aaron was born. And I truly believe that that had a huge impact on the trajectory of Aaron's life. ESPN? Yes. Oh. Because it was right there in their backyard. They could almost reach the NFL or the NBA and see these people being turned into megastars. Aaron was born to his mother, Terry Valentine, and his father, Dennis Hernandez. Dennis was like the hometown hero. He was a great multi-sport athlete. He set so many high school records and was looked at as like the guy, even after high school. So he peaked in high school and then just like all the losers in the town were still like, that's the guy. Sort of like Ray Lewis's dad. Yeah. Where he set all kinds of wrestling records and then set a record for fastest runner out of the house. <laughs> Well, Dennis was the fastest runner into the house to beat the whole family. Oh, so God. Dennis knew that he was the man, and he projected that onto Aaron, like, you will be me or better than me. It's like, that's like a wholesome thing if you want to, like, wish that for your kid, but to mm-hmm. fucking demand it out of your son with Let, an iron fist. Let's be real. It's rarely wholesome. Mm. It's usually the dad forcing the kid to play the sport. And be really good. Yeah, but you could be like looked at as the hometown hero and you could be in the stands just like cheering your kid on and winking like, I know you're going to be as good as me. Not be like, you will be me. Right. Yeah, but I understand what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, I guess you're right. It's It quickly <laughs> becomes abusive because you're trying to will it to happen under any circumstances. Mm-hmm. And by any circumstances usually means violent circumstances. Dennis was physically and verbally abusive to Aaron and his older brother DJ. Uh, Not only that, he would abuse their mother, often in front of the boys. And it was common knowledge that Terry threw Dennis out of the house on multiple occasions. Like, he just got too crazy. And she's like, get the fuck out. Okay, so she was being a good mom there. She was trying to protect the kids for a little bit. Both parents would be arrested for their involvement in different crimes during Aaron's childhood. Just a horrible situation to grow up in. Her too? Yeah, she got involved in, uh, she was in a small time um, underground gambling scheme. (laughs) What? People would call it. Like the McDonald's <laughs> yeah. game? Yeah, exactly. The Monopoly yeah. <laughs> pieces that they all like traded? She would take calls for a local bookie and take bets over the phone. And so she was getting paid for that when people would lose. Mm, okay. So Terry and Dennis were married in 1986, had two kids by 1989, filed for bankruptcy and divorced in 1991. Whoa. And then remarried in 1996 shut up so it's just complete bipolarness between both the parents what is the point of that yeah that that all happened by the time aaron was seven years old my god sounds like bad news because dj and aaron had lived in complete fear of their dad but they also worshiped him and this is the guy who beat them their mother and actually attacked one of aaron's football coaches What? Because Aaron showed up to practice one day with a black eye, obviously from his dad. And the coach asked him, did your father do this to you? And didn't say anything, like just kind of brushed him off like a fell down the stairs type deal. Typical abused kid Mm -hmm. (laughs) response. And he ended up telling his father and his father freaked out and beat the shit out of the coach. Wow. And the coach didn't press charges. Mm -mm. Now, see, that's dumb. Yeah. Why wouldn't he press charges? Maybe he thought he deserved it, too. (laughs) God. So this guy's manipulating everybody, including the coach. Oh, yeah. Because he is, like I said, he is the guy from the town. 
That's one way to deal with that problem. Yeah, just let him do whatever he wants whenever he wants. No, but usually when a teacher is on to one of the parents for being abusive, you involve social services, the principal, whatever. No, this guy just beat the shit out of him and then it all went away. Yeah, you would hope. In 2006, when Aaron was 16 years old, his father died of complications from hernia surgery. You would think, ding dong, the witch is dead, life is good. Instead, Aaron was completely distraught and went from a very subservient kid to a very violent kid capable of outbursts at any given time. So that was the catalyst, the dark side. Yeah, there was a lot of catalysts that happened at this time. Him and his mother started fighting like crazy. They couldn't get along. He kind of blamed his mom, you know, was mad that she was the one that survived and the dad was dead. Just a sickness, Mm. sick way of thinking about things. Yeah. But that's the insidiousness of abuse. Right. So when him and his mother are fighting and then he's like, fuck this, I got to move out. I'm going to move in with my cousin. And I'm sure that they had one of those arguments like, I wish it had been you instead. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. So he moves in with his older cousin, Tanya Singleton. It then came out soon after he moved in that Aaron's mother, Terry, started having an affair with Tanya's husband. Oh, wait, hold on. So he moves in with... His cousin, yep. Tanya, mm-hmm. who's and married. Tanya's married to this guy, Yep, and then Miss Valentine starts sleeping with that guy. Yes. Wow. She was banging her niece's husband, is yeah. essentially what's going on. Wow. She was spreading the Valentines around. <laughs> <laughs> he was eating the Valentines oh, Day boy. candy right there. <laughs> Not so sweet, Tart. <laughs> no. <laughs> so she's fucking her niece's husband. <laughs> While her teenage son is living with them, absolute insanity. This is dysfunctional in the dictionary. Yeah. (laughs) Just their addresses show up. (laughs) Tanya kicks her husband out, obviously, and they think that's the end of it. He's gone. Yep. Terry moves him into Aaron's childhood home. Mm. And so everything's settled. Terry chooses her niece's husband, moves him in. They start banging in front of everybody now because it was a secret before. And the cat- now they're at- forcing people to watch them. Yeah. <laughs> selling tickets at the door. <laughs> That's when Aaron started his criminal activity. And he's in high school at this point. Yes. Yep. 16 years old. So far, I can't blame him for lashing out like this. Yeah, exactly. So he went through years of physical, verbal, and even sexual abuse. Wait, from who? So- some have reported, it's never been confirmed, that the father did it. But DJ said that he was specifically molested by a babysitter's boyfriend starting when he was six years old. So it could have been the same guy. DJ, the younger brother. The older brother. Older brother, okay. Yeah. It's just a recipe for disaster. He's getting abused by his dad, forced to play sports, uh, forced to constantly practice and shoot 500 shots a day on the Uh basketball court and then go run sprints and blah, blah, blah. And he's getting molested at the same time. His parents are fighting. They're both getting arrested. It's just a nightmare. Yeah. His mom's begging his niece's husband, and then he moves into Aaron's childhood home to be with his mom right after the father dies. Right. Uh, in high school, he became an athletic beast. Uh, Hernandez went to Bristol Central High School, where he played for the Bristol Rams football team, and he was also a great basketball player and track runner. He started at wide receiver before becoming a tight end and also played defensive end. Uh, so a wide receiver, if anybody's not hip to the lingo, those are the guys that are f- furthest out on the field and the quarterbacks throwing them the ball. They're usually the smallest and fastest. They could be the tallest, but they're usually not the toughest. They're faster. They get around people. When you go from wide receiver to tight end, that's because now you're looking to get in the scrum of things. You're in the middle of the field where all the toughest players are. You're going against the defensive line, who are the big fat guys that are just pummeling people at the beginning of a play. To the middle and side linebackers. The guys with neck rolls. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're going to people like Ray Lewis, five yards down the field, getting your ass kicked by people in the middle of the field. So, so you have to be tough. Yeah, so he went from being fast and you know wiry to becoming very tough and beating the shit out of people and getting the shit beat out of him. As a senior, he was Connecticut's Gatorade Football Player of the Year. He what had an honor. Yeah. He had 67 receptions for 1,800 yards and 24 touchdowns on offense. On defense, 72 tackles, 12 sacks, three forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and four blocked kicks on defense. 
That's just absolute insanity. A beast is an understatement. Yeah. And that he's playing offense and defense. Is that real normal in high school? In high school, it's pretty normal, yeah. I forget that. Yeah. Uh, they want you to play more on each side of the ball to see if college recruits want you on either side, and then that's when you really pick. I wonder, though, sometimes if it's just obvious where someone belongs. Because why do that then? It is. Well, you do it just in case you he might be a little bit better at one than the other. And they're they're if they're both really good, like he is clearly very good on both sides of the ball. Um, he could have made it in the NFL as a defensive end too. Hernandez's 31 career touchdowns tied the state record, but he also set the state record for receiving yards in a single game with 376, the seventh best in national high school history. He set a national high school record for yards receiving per game with 180.7. A 100-yard game is, like, great. Yeah. That's... Very, very, very good. He almost doubled it. 376 yards in a game receiving is just unheard of. <laughs> wow. It's unnatural. Yeah. Hernandez was considered the top tight end recruit of 2007. So he goes from his dad dying in 2006 to being the top recruit in the country. During one game in 2006, Hernandez took a blindside hit to the head so hard that he was knocked out cold. An ambulance had to take him off the field. Holy. So not only is he a victim of complete trauma at the very beginning of his life, he is getting the snot kicked out of him and taking a lot of brain damage, which we've gone on to find out that CTE is a very real thing and causes not only memory problems, uh, nerve issues but also extreme violence problems yeah it's a problem with your brain it, you're, it makes them act like another person yeah and i imagine that at that age it's essential that doesn't happen yeah while you're developing still right that goes to him playing offense and defense at that high of a level it's just no bueno they can't do that anymore <laughs> put the kids on both sides of the field like eh. that right sure they thought we know i am sure they do you got to limit their time on the field that's not stopping anybody God, because they think that you know the rules are in place to protect players and the the helmets are better now even though oh okay cool there's really no way to avoid it but <laughs> they should just wear those fake sumo outfits <laughs> <laughs> yeah with the hair is the helmet <laughs> He began dating his future fiance, Shiana Jenkins, during high school. At this point, he started smoking a lot of weed, uh, smoking before school, practices and games, and he was, like, always drinking every day. She's like, will you be my Valentine? <laughs> no! It triggers him. <laughs> He's like, what'd you say? <laughs> he punches the coach. <laughs> Uh, what did you get for Valentine's Day? My whore mother dating my <laughs> cousin's husband! What did you get? <laughs> this Hershey's Kiss. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I got a Hershey's Kiss once, too. <laughs> Mr. Hershey down the block. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, going into college, Aaron originally verbally committed to playing football at UConn, which is a great school for basketball, but not so much for football. At first, Aaron didn't care, and he just wanted to play with his brother DJ because he was playing there. Mm. Until the so he was good too. Oh yeah, yep, he was good, but not a pro. That's why he's at UConn. <laughs> what? I was gonna say you can do it. You can do it. You can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> so he was getting, he was gung ho, wanted to play for UConn until Florida Gators. Head coach Urban Meyer, who has recently become persona non grata in the NFL because he took over the Jacksonville Jaguars team and was like kicking his players and pushing them around, talking shit, cutting people for personal reasons, uh, and then got caught like fingering a girl on the dance floor after a game in Ohio when they after they played the Cleveland Browns. He refused to take the flight back with the team, stayed, cheated on his wife, and got filmed doing it. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of... <laughs> but people at this point didn't know he was like that. Okay. so He's still wholesome. He's a huge deal. Urban Meyer flies up to Connecticut not to meet with Aaron, but to go directly to Aaron's high school to talk to the principal. Okay. 
He pretty much forces the principal's hand. He asks him to allow Aaron to graduate a semester early so he could come down and start playing for the Florida Gators, Division I football team. At this point, do his grades even matter? Absolutely not. He's going to graduate even if he flunks the algebra exam. Exactly. The Boston Globe stated, There was no way, except physically, he was ready for this. A young man who came to Gainesville wasn't academically prepared or emotionally grounded for college life. According to previously undisclosed college records and recordings of phone calls Hernandez later made from jail, he graduated high school more than a semester early, not because he was a great student, but because he was a great football player. The author- so it wasn't his essay on the great Gatsby that blew everyone away? <laughs> not at all. The athletic gifts were obvious, but behind them was an angry teenager struggling with, with an abusive upbringing, a growing dependence on drugs, and questions about his own sexuality. What drugs? I just glossed over the sexuality part. Yeah. <laughs> but at this point, is he taking painkillers? What's but going on? What about on? the drugs? <laughs> What's going on with this guy? <laughs> this has come back to be reported as true. I mean, he was drinking and smoking weed, uh, possible pill use, most likely uppers, because when you're playing football, you want to get psyched up. So the last thing you want is, uh, you know, to take a benzo and go to sleep like right. you might want some cocaine and go hit some people mm. but the sexual identity thing is true it's been reported it's true aaron had a secret l- relationship with his own high school quarterback oh right from decider.com hernandez was especially terrified of his father finding out dennis hernandez was described as a man's man and a father that slapped the insert homosexual slur right out of you He says that Hernandez was always on his best behavior around Dennis, as his father was allegedly abusive. He knew he had to be on a different set of behavior around his father. And I was very similar. So it was something that we just had the ability to turn it on and turn it off. We had to hide what we were. And that comes from Dennis Sansusi, who was the quarterback who admitted to... Dennis Sansusi? Sansusi. What are you, Dennis Hernandez over here? (laughs) Jesus. I'm trying to get into the mindset. Yeah. No, but that's huge. I mean, he said they were sneaking having sex like in their houses and obviously their parents didn't know what they were doing, but they were allowed to be in the each other's bedrooms by themselves and they were secretly having sex with their parents home what? and were terrified that they would be caught. Just boys being boys. Yeah. Just a little locker room fuck. <laughs> Right, because if it was a girl he was bringing to his room, they'd be like, leave the door open. Oh, I was never allowed to have a girl even over the house. But yeah, you wouldn't be suspicious if it was a guy. Yeah. And they had sex? Yeah. Like sex sex? Yeah. Wow. According to San Susi. Oof. Because it's very sad. Yeah. That, you know, he went through what he went through, and then he had to hide himself like this. Yeah. Aaron's brother is quoted as saying, I remember Aaron wanted to be a cheerleader. My cousins were cheerleaders and amazing. And I remember coming home and like my dad put an end to that really quick. And it was not okay. My dad made it clear that he had his definition of a man. Jesus. So these- and yet the dad was possibly gay himself. It's possible. Isn't that what you implied earlier? Well, he was very homophobic. And people who are like that homophobic are usually turn out to be gay themselves. So you're not sure, though, that he might have been one of the perpetrators of sexual abuse? It's been reported that way, but it's never been fully confirmed. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So these kids were just tortured by how they felt versus how their fathers would look at them. See, that is just so uncool. Like, the fact that he wanted to be a cheerleader. And, you know, where we grew up, Yeah. that also would have been considered odd. Yeah. If we said, oh, I want to be a cheerleader. Right. It's just weird that anybody cares. I mean, they really don't anymore. I would hope not. Uh, People do. Yeah, I guess it still never quite fully goes away. Yeah. Uh, So he's just going into the world on his own for the first time away from home as a completely tortured person. Urban Meyer is quoted as saying, Aaron was a distressed person. And that's coming from him. Yeah. He's fingering girls on the dance floor. And- yeah. <laughs> like being raiding the in, staff. In Cleveland, of all places. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron was benched for the first college game of his career due to a failed drug test. Ah. And the Florida Gators, at this point, it's the most insane group of players ever assembled. Let me go through right here. 
The Florida Gators arrest record under Urban Meyer. 31 arrests by 25 players in six years. Number one, Dwayne Grace. Charged in July 2005 with misdemeanor, battery, and theft. Charges were dropped by the victim. Oof, another ironic name, Grace. Arrested again and charged in October 2005 on disorderly conduct for his involvement in a fight. He completed 7.5 hours of community service and was suspended indefinitely. He later transferred. Oh, so they didn't keep putting him in, you know, in the game. Yeah. Uh, John Demps. Char- I'm surprised, honestly, but yeah, keep going. John Demps, charged in May 2006 with possession of marijuana, sentenced to 12.5 hours of community service and suspended for three games. Oof. Three, Avery Atkins, charged in July 2006 with domestic battery after an altercation with the mother of his child, suspended immediately by the school, but later had charges dropped. Dropped? Why? Do you see a pattern here? Yeah, getting away with it. Jacques Rickerson, charged in February 2007 with possession of marijuana. Rickerson was suspended for one game, and would you believe this? Charges dropped. Hmm. Sounds like... Mr. Meyer was busy on the telephone. Yeah. Dustin Doe, charged April 2007 with resisting arrest after a fight. He also had the charges dropped and faced zero discipline from the school. Because they coughed up a lot of dough. Hey. Ronnie Wilson, charged in April 2007 with assault and battery, as well as carrying a concealed weapon after an incident in which shots were fired. He pleaded no contest, but had his felony charges reduced to misdemeanors and was sentenced to two years probation and 100 hours of community service. So that sounds like one of the more harsher punishments. Yep, he got the two years probation, 100 hours, and was suspended from both the team and the school for the entire 2007-2008 season and school year. Hmm. Number seven, Jamar Hornsby, cited for property damage for throwing a man onto a car during a fight. The charge, dismissed. I mean, was the man okay, I guess? Let's hope. Number eight, John Curtis, charged in May 2007 for violation of his probation from an earlier alcohol citation. He complied, served the rest of his probation, and would you believe it, the case was dismissed. Okay. Dorian Monroe, charged May 2007 with felony theft after removing a police boot from his car and stashing it in his trunk. The charges were dropped, and Monroe faced no discipline from the school. And what was the police boot (laughs) from? Unpaid tickets. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, I took the boot and put the one on the back tire or whatever. Wow. (laughs) So he's strong. Yeah. The coach is probably like, damn. (laughs) Good job, kid. Proud of you. Number 10, Brandon James, charged in June 2007 with both purchasing and possession of marijuana, a felony and a misdemeanor, respectively. The felony charge was dropped, and James was sentenced to probation for the misdemeanor and suspended one game. It seems a little redundant to me if you're purchasing and possessing. Yeah. Because once you purchase it, you're possessing it. And possess it. It's two things. (laughs) Come on, Larry. (laughs) Tony Joyner. Charged in October 2007 with felony theft for breaking into an impound lot and retrieving his girlfriend's towed car. Hero. The the charges were dropped. (laughs) I bet he got laid that (laughs) night. The charges were dropped and And he was- And so were his pants. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Charges were dropped, pants were dropped, and he was never suspended. But he was removed as team captain. Oh, I'm sure he got over it. Yeah, so less to do. (laughs) Look- (laughs) <laughs> For all the crimes you committed, we have very tragic news. You're not going to be team captain anymore. No! <laughs> He's looking up at the sky. Yeah. <laughs> Jermaine Cunningham, charged in December 2007 with battery after an altercation with a cashier. Charges were dropped, and Cunningham was not suspended. He was forced to forgo his bowl game gifts. You said it was supposed to be 50% off. Son of a bitch. I mean, you got to be nice to the cashier. They didn't do anything. Guac is free. <laughs> it's just their job. Yeah. <laughs> Ronnie Wilson, second incident. Charged in January 2008 with misdemeanor possession of marijuana. Charges dropped. Oh, of course. Jamar. Ronnie Wilson. Jamar Hornsby, second incident. Charged in the spring of 2008 with stolen credit cards 
and the use of them. Hold on. This is this is bad. Okay. Charged in spring 2008 with using stolen credit cards of a Florida student who died <gasps> to make over 70 illegal purchases, mainly gas for his car. He, oh, wow. He took a plea deal and had his sentence reduced to probation and community service, but was dismissed from the team immediately. There's some things you just can't put up with. He later served jail time for assault. Ronnie Wilson, third incident. Jesus. Charged in July 2008 with battery and assault after a fight. Charges were dropped, but Wilson was dismissed from the team. So three strikes and you're out, apparently. That's Un- fair. Unless you're Jamar Hornsby and it's the second incident and you get caught using a stolen credit card of a Florida student who died. Yeah, that's just hard to explain Yeah, to the public. It's hard to get sympathy for that one. Yeah. Jacques Rickerson. Char- These are all repeat offenders. Yep. Charged in November 2008 with felony domestic violence after an altercation with his girlfriend. Rickerson immediately was booted from the team. The charges were reduced to a misdemeanor, and Rickerson got off with probation. Wow. Number 17, Cameron Newton. Oh. Patriots great, Cam Newton. He's still at it lately. He was charged in November 2008 with felony burglary after stealing students' laptops. He served community service and probation and was suspended for the remainder of the season. And then he transferred to Auburn, where he would be in the national championship. So he learned his lesson. Yeah. He never gets into any trouble anymore. Yeah. And then... Didn't he just get into that fight? Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We talked about him on uh, Death and Entertainment Tonight Live, which airs every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Western Pacific. I think that's the word. That's why I was saying he, he's still at it. Yeah, he's still at it. Uh, number 18, Riley Cooper, who was uh, caught on camera using the N-word and mm. subsequently released from the NFL, was charged in February 2009 with failure to comply with a police officer. Case dismissed. Ugh. 2000- yeah, after using the N-word, that's when you got to fly the coop. Yeah. Or- hey. And he was on the Eagles. Fly, Eagles, fly. Ah, there you go. 19, Carl Johnson. He was charged in February 2009 with a violation of a restraining order after getting on the same campus bus as his ex-girlfriend. Charges dropped. Wait a minute. Yeah. Why is that a crime? He got on the same bus as his girlfriend? After she had a restraining order. Oh, I forgot that part. Yeah. What is he doing then? (laughs) That's like the most obvious place you shouldn't go if there's a restraining order. An enclosed long vehicle. Yeah. Where there's a lot of other witnesses. There's six more on the team that Aaron was on the teams that Aaron was on. Tori Davis, Marquise Hanna, Janoris Jenkins, and Dustin Doe. And Dustin also, Doe again. Again, yeah. <laughs> I mean Do Ray Me. <laughs> My God. I don't know what to do. <laughs> uh and Carlos Dunlap. They all He was he was lapping. Yeah. And the funniest he part was of- done laughing, though, because yeah. he got booted. There you go. <laughs> I say all that to say this. You have all these criminals on this team mm-hmm. with Urban Meyer. And would you believe who the quarterback of this team was? Who? Mr. Tim. No. Christ-loving Tebow. Tim Christ-loving Tebow. <laughs> yeah. Are you joking? <laughs> I swear to God. So he's... <laughs> the team like captain and the head of the team and he's got all these people getting arrested around him the entire time he's there while they're winning multiple national championships by the way damn yeah the only crime he was committing was using the lord's name in vain <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so enter tim tebow who also played for the patriots later uh tim actually tried to break up a fight involving aaron in 2007 when they were drinking at a bar called the swamp near the florida campus Sounds like a nice place. Go down to the swamp. <laughs> Aaron tried to duck out on a $12 tab. What? For two drinks. And the manager called him out for it. It was like, you can't leave if you don't pay the tab. Aaron started spitting on him and said he was going to kick his ass. Uh, Tebow begged Aaron to peacefully leave, and he would just pay the tab for him. There's no problem. You get your money. You get to go home. You don't have to pay. Everything's good. Instead, Aaron punched the manager, rupturing his eardrum, and fled the scene. That is a hard punch. Yeah. He was also never arrested for it. And in fact, the police report stated that Aaron was very polite and not intoxicated. What? Football towns. 
It's getting a little absurd. They're protecting their own as much as they can. Yeah, clearly. It's crazy. Rupturing the eardrum. Yep. All over $12. Jesus. So Aaron was always taken out of trouble. So that list that I had, we were, what, 21 names deep on multiple offenders, too? Yeah. And there are many, many more like this where someone punches someone, ruptures their eardrum, and doesn't even get in trouble for it. Those were just the people who were caught. Wow. So he was taken out of trouble every time since he was playing for the big Division One school. And by his junior year, he, had, he was actually doing extremely well. In 2009, he won the John Mackey Award. And that goes to the number one tight end in the country. So that is quite an honor. Yeah. So you can't really get better than that. So after his 2009 season, instead of going to his senior year, he made himself eligible for the 2010 NFL Draft. And I remember this draft very well. I was actually ripping my hair out screaming because in the second round, we pick NFL future great Rob Gronkowski. Whoa. And then our fourth round pick was used on Aaron Hernandez. And I'm in the green room of a comedy club just screaming like, what the fuck are you guys doing? We already had like Algie Crumpler. We already had tight ends on the team. And so now you're getting two more. I was like, how many fucking tight ends do we need? And Louis Anderson is going, what's with this guy in the green room? Ah, touch my dick. <laughs> so you were mad, though, about Aaron Hernandez? I was fuming. But why? Because how many tight ends do you need? I'm like, they're only going to use one at a time. Not you didn't realizing. know that he had all the this prestige behind him? No. Okay. You didn't hear about the eardrum? Yeah, I couldn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Big twist, it was me he punched. <laughs> so even though we got to see some of the best in-game performances from a two tight end set that any football fan will ever see in their lives, maybe someone should have been asking the same question I was asking. Why the fuck are we getting two tight ends? Because you're bringing in a troubled kid from Bristol that's now going to be making millions of dollars 100 miles away from most of the trouble. Hmm. I just wanted to bring up that you said he was a fourth round pick. Mm -hmm. 113th overall. But wouldn't he have been picked sooner if he didn't have that troubled history? Yes. I heard that that played into why he was in the fourth round. Yes. So he was signed to a four year $2.37 million contract. And typically that round where he was selected you would normally get a $500,000 signing bonus, but they kept his pay so low as a precautionary measure so he wouldn't get into trouble. Wow. There were multiple incentives to get him an extra $700,000, but he would have to reach every single one of those incentives. That's what Robert Kraft thought was the best to keep him on the straight and narrow. The owner of the Patriots. Yes. Because and a daddy figure to Aaron. Yeah. In the pre-draft report, which is like, normal every player that is entering into the draft goes through it he scored the lowest score you could possibly get on social maturity and he failed multiple drug tests he had all this stuff he had attitude problems you know beating people up they found the patriots found out about all of that and i hate to say it but what does that matter if you're looking for a monster to go out on the field and kill other football players well you know <laughs> not only is that actually true it is figuratively true yeah uh yeah the patriots didn't announce this to anybody though they just kind of kept it in house knowing that he was a ticking time bomb and like let's just keep his pay low that'll do it yeah that'll make him not want to go and sell drugs on the side to make more money of course <laughs> so like i said the patriots fans were all surprised at what eventually happened to aaron hernandez but people in the clubhouse the people in the locker room not really as shocked the ones that really got to know him. Yeah. Wes Welker actually was not a fan. And who's he? Wes Welker was our top slot wide receiver. So he was the short guy on the field. I think he was like five foot nine. He would line up in the middle of the uh in the middle of the field, go over the middle and be able to be like the little squirrel going around all the big guys. He was yeah. faster and can cut through. And he was legendary for us. He was actually a punt returner for us. Very, very fast, very tough. Made a lot of tough catches. And he was a leader on our team. 
And when Brandon Lloyd, who was a wide receiver that came in for the first year, he saw Aaron, he saw, you know, what he was capable of. And he was like, oh, man, he's going to open up a lot of routes for me. And I'm going to we're going to take this to the Super Bowl. But little did he know that his locker was going to be right next to Aaron Hernandez. And we'll see what they say. I had a lot of admiration for Aaron's athletic ability. I mean, it was impressive. So I'm like, all right, my odds are pretty good to get to the Super Bowl. But I quickly realized that something was going on. There was this troubling undercurrent. And that's what people said, just meeting him a couple times. And when you actually get to know him, this is like Wes Welker did. This is what he gave him the heads up on. During training camp, Wes Welker makes his beeline over to me. And I grabs me like by the shoulders. He says, Brandon, your locker is in between Gronk and Aaron Hernandez. Now, Aaron, he's going to fondle his genitalia in front of you. What? He's going to talk about bathing with his mom. You just got to ignore it. You got to ignore it. It was like Wes has seen a ghost. And Oh, man. Yeah, so he would take his dick out and, like, jerk off in front of other players' faces and, like, wiggle his dick in front of their faces and stuff, uh, talking about having sex with other players in, like, an aggressive way, like, threatening it. <laughs> like, yeah, bully tactics. Yeah. And why did Wes Welker just say to ignore it? Because he watched Belichick over and over not do anything to correct Aaron's behavior because he was such a good player. Head coach. Yeah. Head grimacer of the M- <laughs> NFL. <laughs> yeah, seriously. The curmudgeon, the resident NFL curmudgeon, Bill Belichick, he, who was notorious that if you even looked at him wrong, he would cut you, uh, to not do anything to correct Aaron's behavior when multiple players were complaining about it, being like, dude, this kid, what the fuck is wrong with this kid? Yeah, at best, he's socially awkward. Yeah, at the very <laughs> best, to say the very least. <laughs> so Wes Welker was our number one punt returner, and there was a day of practice that Hernandez was like, I'm the best fucking punt returner on the team, and ye- was yelling at, at Bill Belichick, and this is what Wes Welker had to say. You know, I thought Aaron was a good kid. I had a locker right next to him, tried to help him, tried talking to him, but at the same time, I don't know, is uh, I think it was pretty glaring um, that there were issues. Go, Brandon. Wait, in the locker room, we get away with saying a lot of offensive and disturbing things. And the other ones, they gang bang. <laughs> but what Aaron was saying, it deviated far off the norm of just locker room bullshitting around. He would rage out on players, you know, motherfucking people, saying he's going to beat their ass, fucking I'll kill you, which is something that I don't take lightly. When Aaron would have meltdowns, Dion could come over and have a quiet conversation with him. Dion is Dion Branch, and he played for us, left to go to the Seahawks, and came back. And this is the time where he had the second stint with Aaron Hernandez. And these two were actually such good friends that uh, Aaron moved in in a house directly across the street from Dion Branch. Ah. So they were so close that, like, Cheyenne Jenkins, who is Aaron's wife, would come over and help Dion with his family when his wife wasn't there and, like, make sure the kids were all taken care of. And, you know, they would do that for each other. See, I've seen interviews with this guy, and he seems like a nice person. He's a very nice person. So I don't understand how he could get so close to Aaron Hernandez then. Yeah, it's just, like, you feel bad when you know someone didn't have a great upbringing and mm. you think, hey, I could be, like, a father figure or a big brother to this kid. And But still, there's not one moment where Aaron pulls his nutsack out and starts <laughs> hooting and hollering. There's many moments. And scares his friend off. <laughs> well, you know what I mean, though. Yeah. How could this guy be that close with him? Well, that's the one thing that Dion Branch says in this documentary, which is, this is on Apple TV, by the way. It's called The Dynasty, and it's a 10-part miniseries, docuseries, that completely delves into the 20 years that the Patriots had a fucking iron grip on the NFL. Right, and now that you mention it, 
Hernandez comes in in 2010. That's about halfway through the dynasty. Yep. Which started during 2000, 2001. Right after Drew Bledsoe left and Tom Brady came in. Yeah. Well, Drew Bledsoe Bledsoe was hit so hard by Mo Lewis on the New York Jets that he severed an artery in his chest and almost died and had to be sat out after surgery. Yeah. And then Tom Brady comes in and things change. Yeah, we, we know what happened there. <laughs> yeah. But Dion Branch was a part of two stints of the dynasty. And yeah, he at the very beginning says, like, I don't know how I didn't see it coming. And he feels stupid. But I'm like, how can you blame yourself? But then you get to find out that they were really good friends. And there was more than enough red flags for him to be like, OK, maybe this dude isn't so good. Yeah, I can you know, I can't imagine he didn't pick up on some of his darkness. Yeah. We continue on. I probably had the closest relationship with with Aaron. And I was neighbors. He lived right across the street from me. His lady used to come over and help with the kids. Anytime Aaron was boiling, Coach would always ask me, is everything good? Is everything good? Is everything good? It was like, check with Dion. So he's like his handler in a way. Yeah, it's crazy. Him saying, check with Dion. Bill Belichick would check in with him saying, you know, how is he doing this week? How's he doing today? What's going on? Keep me in the loop. And it's like, Dion's doing way too much for his pay grade. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not one of the highest paid players on the team. And now he's being used as not only a coach spy in a way, but also the dude that's supposed to keep Aaron on track. Right. He's not a babysitter. That's exactly what he's become. And it, it sounded like he needed one. But at that point, you cut the guy. You don't let his play dictate how shitty he's treating people. And this is this is the actual point where Wes Welker gets fed up with him. Red area. I remember one particular time we're out there doing a walkthrough with Tom. Aaron's out there in flip flops, going through the drills, laughing, flipping the ball around, calling Bill Belichick daddy. Ugh. Tom's like, man, get the fuck out of here. They're like, what the fuck are you doing? You hear Tom scream at him, like saying, stop. Yeah, I can only imagine him putting up with Aaron Hernandez must have been a big chore. Yeah, let's hear it again. Calling Bill Belichick daddy. Tom's like, man, get the fuck out of here. They're like, what the fuck are you doing? Get the fuck off the field. That got a rise out of Aaron. Oh, he was MFing, motherfucker. You know, stormed off the field. And oftentimes... That didn't elicit any response out of Bill. And this is his rookie year. He's telling Tom Brady he's going to kill him because he tells him to stop fucking around on the field. Mm. On return. Remember one time in practice, we were doing punt return, you know, we're catching balls, and Aaron was sitting there, I'm the best return on this team. Bill, why am I not back here? Da, 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 da. Like, literally a rookie sitting there talking like this. And like Bill's like laughing, and like I'm not <laughs> laughing. I I'm like, why does he love this guy? I don't get it. And it makes me sick to think that Bill Belichick was just chuckling at his boy Aaron. And Wes just he's never talked bad about anyone publicly, and now he's saying like I just don't get it. I don't understand why you people like him so much. Like this dude is bad news. Coaches used to yell at kids for smirking on the field yeah exactly much less bringing the practice to a dead halt and disrespecting the other players coming out in flip-flops instead of pads and a helmet and actual you know shoulder pads like he was supposed to just has a sleeveless shirt on with sweatpants and flip-flops just throwing the ball around robert Kraft and bill belichick had a hard on for aaron hernandez that's it absolutely 100% correct. And there was nothing any of the players could do about it, no matter how much. So they stopped complaining. They were just like, all right, he's in. We're out. And what a terrible position for them. Yeah. We've all been there where, for some reason, you're involved in some scenario where someone is getting preferential treatment. Yeah. And they suck. Yeah. And you just kind of have to deal with it while you're there. Yeah. I mean, Welker was right. Hernandez had once been the top tight end prospect and was taken 113th overall due to failed drug tests, run-ins with the law, and character concerns. And like I said, he got the lowest possible score on the social maturity meter by the NFL standards. <sighs> the lowest score you could possibly get for maturity. Ed Gein scored higher than him. Yeah. 
like I said, he got a four-year, $2.3 million contract, with it, which is absurdly low. Absurd. Four years. He's making hundreds of thousands instead of millions. He was the number one tight end coming out of college with multiple national championships. Not only is that low, that sounds illegal. Yeah. I'm surprised they could do that. Right. Like I said, there were multiple incentives to get him an extra seven hundred grand, but he would have to reach every single one. And that's what Robert Kraft and Bill Belichick decided that was the best to keep him on track. And for the most part, he did his first year, other than, you know, locker room concerns. He was on the straight and narrow. He helped the team go 14-2 and two in his first season before losing to the New York Jets in the first round of the playoffs. So they're building. Wait, the Jets won a game then? In the playoffs against the Pats. <laughs> wow. Yuck. The next year, Mr. Chad Ochocinco comes to town. That reminds me of another Aaron, by the way, talking about the Jets. Yeah. Another <laughs> weirdo. <laughs> yeah. So his rookie year, Aaron Hernandez had been wearing number 85. And so Chad Ochocinco, if you know a, a lick of Spanish, uh oh, eight five. Now there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, does Aaron continue wearing the eighty five and say "fuck off, Ochocinco," or uh, does he do a favor for the team and give him the number? He gives him the number, I assume. It's said that Jose Baez, which is Aaron's attorney, asked Ochocinco for fifty thousand dollars, which Ochocinco gave in exchange for the number. Now that $50,000, it's been reported that Aaron used as a loan for his cousin's new husband for a wholesale marijuana purchase. And for the $50,000... What is he, buying it from Costco? Yeah. What the hell's <laughs> happening there? He was actually arrested for not having a membership. <laughs> um, a fake membership. Yeah. <laughs> they forged it. Counterfeit Costco <laughs> membership. He was trying to get the gas. Uh, he was given back $120,000 for the 50000 he gave his cousin's husband. Mm. So even though he's pretending to be on the straight and narrow, and he's not getting into any altercations that the news is finding out about, he's still very heavily involved in his CD past. So he's hanging out with ghouls from high school that weren't on the football team. He's still in with the Bloods. Yeah. So the Patriots the next year end up going 13-3. and three. And have an outstanding year by Aaron, who had 910 reception yards. So 1,000 reception yards is usually, like, very good. That's the bar from being good to great. Yeah. And the Patriots end up going to the Super Bowl and lose to the Giants 21-17. So no Super Bowl ring for Aaron. No. 2012. So Aaron has the best year of his life. Um, outside of high school where he gets Gatorade Player of the Year, sets all the state, national, mm -hmm. local records. In August of 2012, Aaron was gifted a $40 million contract with a $12.5 million signing bonus. That's quite a pay raise from the, what was it, 40000 Yeah, pretty much. The, the, the initial... The initial contract. signing bonus was two hundred grand, and the contract was $2.3 million. So this is 20 times that. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's the big leagues, as they say. Hefty. This is after his first two years. He goes 14-2. and two, They lose in the first round to the Jets. And then his second year, they go to the Super Bowl against the Giants and lose. And then I imagine he's thinking, this is just the start yeah. of Dynasty Part Duh. Yeah, and it was. So, like I said, August 2012, Aaron gets $40 million in a contract with a $12.5 million signing bonus. While the Patriots organization thought he was doing everything he could to dedicate himself to the business of football, it was quite the opposite. His drug use was rampant, his drinking was out of control, and he was becoming more and more paranoid. Cocaine and marijuana and stuff like that. You name it. And now, he had come into a fortune. Little did the Patriots know that one month before Aaron was given this contract, that he had been out drinking in Boston's theater district. He was at Cure Nightclub downstairs inside the Wilbur Theater, which is Boston's go-to theater for nationally touring comedians. Like yourself, you've performed there? I've performed there many times. I've opened up for like Bobby Kelly and Jim Norton there. Big, big names. Yes. So he's at this club, which is downstairs. It used to be so annoying. The theater would be upstairs, and then you would come downstairs after, and it's just like people everywhere. It, it, Sounds like a fire hazard. I hate the nightclub scene. It's just ugh. right. You, I'm a bar guy, not a nightclub. You're guy. trying to have a conversation. Yeah, and then you got Miley Cyrus pumping in your ears. Yeah. 
So he's down there in the basement, and a man accidentally spilled a drink on him. <clears throat> How would you think Aaron would respond? He was like, oh, I'm sorry that you spilled that on me. Oh, it's cool, man. <laughs> I was in your way. I, I really apologize. Yeah. Let me move. <laughs> <laughs> he felt disrespected, and Aaron had words for the man and his friend. Security footage shows Aaron and his buddy leaving the nightclub and waiting in their car. When the two other guys leave that he had been arguing with, it is seen that an SUV similar to the one that Aaron was in followed them. Just a couple blocks down the road on a highway overpass, the two men Aaron had just been arguing with were found shot dead in their car. Coincidence? No suspects were identified in the immediate aftermath of the shooting. Huh. So Aaron's out there partying, still only has his $2.3 million contract. He's lending relatives 50 grand a pop to go buy weed and gets into an altercation with this guy. Ends up dead about an hour after he spills the drink on Aaron Hernandez. The two guys. Yeah. Uh, 2012. So one of the guys just died being next to his buddy. Yep. That's the only reason he's dead. Yep. God. I understand killing the guy that spilled the drink. Yeah. Come on. Did you have to kill the other guy too? Hey, what's going on here? 2012 ends up being Aaron's worst year as a professional. Really? So he was not motivated by the new money. Am I actually onto something there that this sociopath wasn't motivated by money? Uh, you might be onto something. Maybe he was power. Mo- power, exactly. Money, power, respect. What you see in life. One out of three ain't bad. Yeah. So I think maybe you're onto something because. Week two of the season against the Arizona Cardinals, he got a high ankle sprain and wasn't able to play for most of the year. So he probably wasn't training as hard, partying a lot, ends up getting an ankle sprain because he's not maybe as strong as he used to be Uh, because he's out drinking and doing drugs. And then naturally that would be your worst year, one that you're not even really playing. Yeah, but he eventually recovers and he helps the Patriots get to another AFC championship where the Patriots lose again to the Baltimore Ravens, and future wife beater, Ray Rice. Oh. And past possible murderer. Yeah. I remember this Super Bowl very well, because we did just talk about it on the Ray Lewis episode. Oh, that's right. So the Colin Kaepernick and the 49ers. Yep. When the lights went out. Yeah, the the booty blackout, they called it, (laughs) because Beyonce was the halftime show. Oh, she knocked it over with her dump truck ass? (laughs) Yeah, and then the lights went out. (laughs) (laughs) And then the Ravens prevailed and won the Super Bowl. Stark Raven mad. Right. Um, (laughs) (laughs) During that offseason, players were complaining about Hernandez still being unhinged and becoming increasingly erratic in the locker room. Uh, during this time, it's reported that Aaron... Increasingly. Yeah. So it got worse? It got crazier. I wonder what that entails. But wait, there's more. What, did he like bend over and spread his <laughs> butt cheeks <laughs> and light, light his ass on fire <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> while saying racial slurs? Yeah, pretty much. But during this time, this is interesting to me, that it's reported Aaron actually told Belichick that he was in fear for he and his family's lives and that he wanted a trade to the West Coast to get away from the trouble brewing at home. Hmm. Belichick reportedly denied that request. So he desperately goes to his coach for a way out. Yeah. But keep in mind, this is just shortly after those two people were shot in a nightclub that he was just a part of. Yeah, his story is BS. The real story is he doesn't want the cops to get hot on his tail. Yeah. But either way, all Belichick knows is that he's in trouble and wants... You know, to be far away. Yeah. Did he give a reason for not honoring his request? He said that he could provide him with NFL and Patriots security. And Hernandez said, nah, never mind. Mm. So he wasn't that upset about his safety. Okay. In that time, it's also been reported that Belichick was so fed up with him in June of 2013 that he was planning on releasing him before the start of the regular season. Wait, so he wasn't going to trade him, but he was going to release him? Yes. What's the thinking there? I think that that's a Patriots organization fed story. Or I just thought of this theory. If he trades him, then he may have to go up against Hernandez. 
who he views as a monster at his best on the field. Yeah. And so he, to re- instead to just release him, that's more of a whimper. Yeah. He also could fear trading Aaron Hernandez away, pretty much like selling a lemon to another team. Right. Knowing that he's going to crumble. Oh, wait. Maybe, but wouldn't that be a good strategy then? I mean, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> He's really good. He'll he'll do you real nice. Yeah. I honestly, I think it's an organization fed story that Belichick was so fed up with him that he was going to release him in June, of, uh, had meetings in June 2013. Oh, that never happened, you're saying? I don't think that that's true. Because George W. Bush having meetings about capturing bin Laden before 9-11. Exactly. So in June of 2013, that's when it's reported that Belichick had that meeting. Mm-hmm. What also happens in June 2013 is that there was a body found in an industrial park a mile away from Aaron Hernandez's home where a man was shot execution style. Did I say one mile away from Aaron Hernandez's home? You did. Okay, well, I'll double hit that. The body ended up being identified as Odin Lloyd, which is the future brother-in-law of Aaron Hernandez. So I'm sure Aaron is just shaking in his boots knowing that <laughs> such a murder took place near yeah. his house. And he's going to be released from the Patriots? Right. What's a man to do? Yeah. So a jogger had found Odin's body while they were on their morning run. Odin had been found with a car rental key in his front pocket. Joggers always find bodies. I know. that. I, that's why I don't run. Odin, like I said, the, had the rental car key in his pocket. And so detectives take that and they go to the rental car company asking who had their name under the tag on the rental keys. Was it Hertz? Uh, no, it was Enterprise, I believe. Okay. But if it was Hertz, they'd have O.J. Simpson and Aaron Hernandez on their yeah. on their hands. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Enterprise, donut. Nice. So... When they asked the clerk, like, are you willing to tell us whose name this is under? The cashier's jaw dropped and was like, oh, my God. And they were like, what? And they said it had been rented under Aaron Hernandez. Then the cop drops his coffee cup. Yeah. (laughs) It shatters. We got a break in the case. Aaron reportedly had a dispute that he wanted to settle with Odin, who also played semi-pro football in Boston and was in a relationship with Aaron's wife's sister. So... That is effectively his brother-in-law. Exactly. And they were going to get married, so they were going to officially be brother-in-law. Wow. When he was picked up by Aaron the night before, he had texted people who had seen him leave his home. You saw who picked me up, right? NFL. And those were the last texts he sent. Hmm. Because he wanted to give one last clue, if anything happened to him, who did it. So Fair enough, but why did... He should have just said, Aaron Hernandez yeah, exactly. <laughs> picked me up and he's pissed. I outsmarted them all. I left the, the biggest clue that they have to figure out and yeah. <laughs> bounce around off each other to figure out what it means. Yeah. Just say the name. Yeah, exactly. And Aaron was joined in the car by two other people who were accomplices in Odin's murder as well. Wow. So there's four of them in the car going to Attleboro, Massachusetts, knowing that Odin's going to be the one not leaving the car alive. Jeez. Yeah. What could his future brother-in-law have possibly done to warrant this? I mean, that is the biggest question. It wasn't even answered in the trial. They think that he had found out about one of um, Aaron's homosexual trysts. He was nervous that Odin would tell his girlfriend, which was his wife's sister, and that it would all get convoluted and blown up and blown out of the water, Hmm. that he is, in fact, a gay man. Okay. It's possible. Does make sense. Yeah. So before the shooting, Aaron had gassed up his car and bought a pack of (gasps) cotton candy bubblicious gum, which is also the exact gum they found in the front seat of Aaron's rental car. Oh, my God. Joined with a bullet casing that also exactly matched Aaron's registered firearm that also went missing after the shooting. And I would have gotten away with it, too, if it wasn't for that damn bubble yum. Yeah. I got to say, good taste in uh, Bubblicious. Cotton candy is my favorite flavor, and that's what I had playing baseball growing up my whole life. Hey. Very good. Yeah, you and him have similar tastes. Yeah, we're not all bad after all. <laughs> you have similar predilections. Yeah. <laughs> Preferences, some would say. <laughs> uh, so, like I said, we don't know even after the trial what led Aaron to kill one of his closest friends, but it's reported that Odin may have found out about a homosexual relationship Aaron was having. So... June 18th, the body's found. 
construction site. Yes, industrial park. Not really that hidden, right? No, it was out in the open. Yeah, yeah, they didn't hide anything. It's an they odd just, choice. Li- they just left him with the rental keys in his pocket and everything that could be identified. They, yeah, there was three of them. So what? Aaron and his two friends. So the two friends were they convicted too? Yeah, yeah. So on June 26th, eight days later, after gaining a mountain of evidence, Aaron Hernandez was arrested on a first-degree murder charge. Mm. Now, what's crazy about this day, and this is a part of the story nobody else will have. Okay. We have a die exclusive. 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 An acquaintance of mine and some of my friends was tipped off about Aaron's incoming arrest. And on June 26th, 2013, he hits up me and a buddy of mine who at the time we owned a YouTube channel called Any Hip Hop, Northeast Hip Hop. And interviewed Machine Gun Kelly. Yeah. Name it. Yeah. Many of uh, the Wu Tang Clan, uh, Red Man, a bunch of people. So we had friends who were local that also would like manage or be connected to some of the bigger rappers out there. And he was a manager of Static Selecta, who is a rapper and DJ. And he was rushing to Aaron's house to get a poster of Static Selecta's new CD that was coming out that week so he could put it on his mailbox just before Aaron would be all over the news getting arrested. And people would see the CD cover and be like, oh shit, I gotta get that album. Wait. (laughs) So this guy knew that Aaron was about to get arrested. Yeah. And so rushed over to put his CD on the mailbox. Yeah. So that it would be be seen by news cameras. By millions and millions. So that... Brings the question, how did he know? He would never, he never told us. He got a tip somehow, some way, even before Aaron knew, because Aaron was still home. Hmm. So they went and arrested him. Wow. We have the footage of Aaron getting arrested that very morning. North Attleboro, Massachusetts. Question. Yeah. Why is his shirt over his arms like that? Because he had no shirt on and he requested to be covered. He didn't want to show off his guns? No, apparently not that day. And we're here. He's getting put into the cop car. And what do you see on the mailbox? Static Selecta. Holy shit. (laughs) Nobody has ever talked about this because I don't think anybody's ever noticed. But that's pretty amazing. It was guerrilla marketing pretty much at its finest. I don't know if it actually converted to record sales or not, but it was just hilarious that he hits us up, lets us know. We're freaking out. He's like, just watch the news, and it's coming. And we didn't even know what he was talking about. And all of a sudden, not only did we think that he was full of shit, we were like, holy God damn, he actually did it before the news <laughs> showed up. Insane. We were like, holy shit, he called his shot, and he did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean... <laughs> How else could that ever happen? Like, you'd have to be tipped off on this arrest. Yes. And then show up in time. Before the the news crews get there. What are the odds you even beat the news crews and the cops? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then get out of there. Yeah, this random dude who manages a rapper. (laughs) Wow. Knows about Aaron's arrest before Aaron knew about it. (laughs) Like, Aaron, if he knew he was really going to get arrested, he would have fled. Right, he would have put a shirt on. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it was an album called Extended Play. And then the next week, it's number one on the Billboard charts. (laughs) Subliminally, they're like, we don't know how this happened. Out of nowhere, it shot to the top. Yeah. It was released on June 18th, 2013 by Duck Down Music and Show Off Records. And June 18th is when Odin Lloyd was found. And they had a ton of great people on it. Uh, Action Bronson was on it. Uh, Tony Touch, Raekwon the Chef, who I interviewed. Joey Badass, Black Thought. Lead singer and rapper of The Roots. Uh, Sean Price, Mac Miller, Mike Posner, Freddie Gibbs, Prodigy. You gotta be Joe. This is like a murderer's row. Yeah. Joel Ortiz, Styles P, Bun B, Tylib Kweli, Flatbush, Flatbush Zombies. Wait, I have a faster method. Yeah. Who in the hip-hop industry wasn't on this album? Yeah, exactly. The album debuted at number 121 on the Billboard Top 200 chart with first week sales of 3,600 copies in the U.S. So Pretty good. But this would count as second week. I want to see what the second week did. 
Because it was eight right. days eight days after it debuted. That's too soon for the guerrilla campaign to kick in. Exactly. It got great critical reviews, seven out of ten, eight out of ten, seven point five out of ten. But this wasn't publicized at all. No, nobody knows about this. Nobody even realizes it. So his mistake was not tipping off the media afterwards. That is true. Call it in because they would have loved this story. They, yeah. The news eats this stuff up with a spoon. That's a good point. Is it too late? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if this podcast, this story gets out and people go, holy shit, and then start wanting to listen to this album and they just have a huge boom. <laughs> well, you make me want to listen to it. It's a great album. If I'm like anybody else. It is a great album. I will give it that. <laughs> okay, so let's see. We're going to be we're gonna be paying attention to our position on the charts this week. Yeah. <laughs> and that album's. Yeah, exactly. So that's a Diepod exclusive. Nobody else is going to have anywhere. Love it. As we know, the evidence was overwhelming and he was convicted to life in prison. So case closed, right? That's it. Not by a long shot. What? Come back for episode two of the life and crimes of Aaron Hernandez. Woo, 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 woo. That year, Hernandez gets arrested. Gronk breaks his back. Yeah. They sign Amendola. He got hurt. Danny Amendola. Holy shit, I remember him. Yeah. yeah, and then they're like, and I was there. I I didn't have much stats or anything, and, and they didn't want to give me the keys or anything, but they had no choice, and then I took it and ran. It's Yeah, literally. Yeah.